thank you for coming out this morning. Chris, thank you for the, for the warm welcome. If you could all do me a favor and take out your smartphones and point them at the QR code, and that'll take you to a download of today's materials. That way, if you'd like to, during the course of our chat, you don't need to take as many photos. <laughs> now, I got into town over the weekend. I got in, this is my first time in London, and I've been navigating the city, and I've been having a fantastic time, and it really got me thinking about something. It got me thinking about the fact that I could use my phone to get anywhere I needed to go. And it got me to think about how ubiquitous it is that we can navigate easily anywhere we want to go. It's built into our cars. I rode bicycle, and I have a computer on my road bike, and we always know where I am. You can buy a little chip now, and you can sew it into the back of your children's sweatshirts and things, and always know where they're at. So it's really ubiquitous, but it didn't start out that way. When I learned to drive, I learned to drive with a map. And as a matter of fact, I was graded on how well I could refold the map. Obviously a skill that I haven't worried about since then. But I was also driving during the digital transition when all of that amazing cartography information was digitized. And somebody realized, we can put a front end on this and we can ask people where they're starting, where they're going, and then we can give them step-by-step -step place to go. But they still had to print it out. And if you happen to be the first person who is in the passenger seat, you got to be the voice. In 100 meters, take a left. The ramp onto the M4. And it wasn't long until we had special hardware. Now we had a Garmin, or we had a TomTom, -tom, and it was mixing the cartography information, it was mix mixing the voice aspect, and it was mixing that hardware together, and it was fantastic. Now, when my children started to drive, they started with a TomTom, -tom, but I made them learn to read a map, because if you can see what it says there, the signal was lost. But now, it's everywhere. It is ubiquitous for us. In 2008, the iPhone was released, the iPhone 3G, and it had that sensor in it. And now, everywhere that we went, we have the ability to tell where we are. We can track our packages. We can track when the car is coming to pick us up. We can track all sorts of different things. We've just begun to expect that. What does that have to do with AI, with software engineering? That's because I believe that this is where we're at right now. I think we're at the digital transition when it comes specifically to generative AI and leveraging that to help us to build software. So yes, my name is Tracy Bannon. I go by Trace. I like word clouds. Uh, and I am a software architect. I am a researcher now. And that's been something newer in my career over the last couple of years. I work for a company called the MITRE Corporation. We're federally funded research and development. The US government realized that they needed help. They needed technologists that weren't trying to sell anything. So I get paid to talk straight. It's kind of cool. So let's go back in time, everybody. 2023. Where were you when you heard that 100 million people were using chat GPT? I don't know. I do remember that all of a sudden my social feed, my emails, newsletters, everything said AI, 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 right? Chronic FOMO. It's almost as though you expect to go walking down the aisle in the grocery and see AI stickers slapped on the milk and on the biscuits and on the cereal, because obviously it's everywhere, it's everything. Please, don't get swept up in the hype. Now, I know here at QCon and with InfoQ, we prefer to talk about crossing the chasm. But I'm going to use the Gartner hype cycle for a moment. The words are beautiful. Are we at the technology trigger when it comes to AI and software engineering? Are we at the peak? of inflated expectations, the trough of disillusion, and have we started up the slope of enlightenment yet? Are we yet at that plateau of productivity? Where do you think we are? It's one of the few times that I agree with Gartner. We are at the peak of inflated expectations. Now granted, Gartner is often late to the game. No offense to anybody from Gartner who's here, but by the time they realize it, oftentimes I believe that we're further along the hype cycle. But what's interesting here is, 
two to five years to the plateau of productivity. How many people would agree with that? Based on what I'm seeing, based on my experience, based on research, I believe that's correct. What we do as software architects, as software engineers, is really complex. And it's not a straight line in any decision that we're making. We use architectural trade-off. I love the quote by Grady Booch, the entire history of software engineering is one of rising levels of abstraction. And we've heard about that this week. We've heard about the discussions of needing to have orchestration platforms of many, many different layers, of many, many different libraries that are necessary to abstract and make AI, generative AI in specific, helpful. Yes, I like word cloud. I mentioned that before. I have the luxury of working with about 200 of the leading data scientists and data engineers in the world. So I sat down with a couple of them and said, I'm going to QCon. This is the audience. How would you explain to me all of the different types of AI that exist, the ML universe beyond generative AI? Boy, did we draw frameworks. We had slide after slide after slide. So I came back to it and said, you know, let's take this instead like Legos and dump them on the table. What's important to take away from this slide is that generative AI is simply one piece of a massive puzzle. There are many, many different types of AI, many types of ML, many different types of algorithms that we can and should be using. So where do you think AI can be used within DevSecOps, within the software development lifecycle? Now the next slide I'm going to show you is one that's worth coming back to. It's an eye chart. Please do download it because you're not going to be able to read it. The first time I published this was in October of last year. And there are at least a half a dozen additional areas that have been added to that during the this time. What's important is that generative AI is only one piece of the puzzle here. We've been using AI, we've been using ML, for years and years and years. How do we get after digital twins? If we're dealing with cyber physical systems, we're not simply generating new scripts and new codes, we're leveraging deterministic algorithms for what we need to do. And remember that generative AI is non-deterministic. With it though, it has groundbreaking potential, generative AI in specific, groundbreaking potential. And it has limitations and has challenges. I love this slide. You're going to see this slide a couple of times. I simply love the photo. Treat generative AI like a young apprentice. And I don't mean somebody who's coming out of college. I mean that 15-year-old brings a lot of energy and you're excited to have them there and occasionally they do something right and it really makes you happy. But most of the time, you're cocking your head to the side and saying, what the heck were you thinking? We heard that with stories this week in the tracks, especially around AI and ML. So pay close attention. Pay very close attention. And yes, I learned my lesson, and I do use note cards. Now, I'm going to take you back for a moment and just make sure that I say to you that this is not just my opinion. This is what the research is showing. There are service providers who have provided AI capabilities who are now making sure that they have all kinds of disclaimers and they have all kinds of advice for you, that they're providing guidance that says, make sure you have humans in the loop. Do you think that generative AI contradicts DevSecOps principles? Any thoughts on that? Well, I will tell you that sort of, it does. So when I think about traceability, if it's being generated by a black box that I don't own, that's much more difficult. How about auditability? That's part of DevSecOps. How am I going to be able to audit something that I don't understand where it came from or the provenance for it? Reproducibility, anybody ever hit the regenerate button? Does it come back with the same thing? Reproducibility, explainability. Do you understand what was just generated and handed to you? Whether it's a test, whether it's code, whether it's script, whether it's something else, do you understand? And then there's security. We're going to talk a lot about security today, so I'm glad that we are having a security track today as well. There was a survey of over 500 developers. And of those 500 developers, 
56% of them are leveraging AI, and of that 56%, all of them are finding security issues in the code completion or the code generation that they're running into. There's also this concept of reduced collaboration. Why? Why would there be reduced collaboration? Well, if you're spending your time talking to your GAI friend and not talking to the person beside you, you're investing in that necessary prompting and chatting. It has been shown so far to reduce the collaboration. So where are people using it today for building software? We've spent a lot of time this week talking about how we can provide it as a capability to end users, but how are we using it to generate software, to build the capabilities we deliver into production? Well, I don't ignore the industry or the commercial surveys, because if you're interviewing or surveying hundreds of thousands of people, even tens of thousands of people, I'm not going to ignore that as a researcher. So yes, Stack Overflow, friends. So, 37,000 developers answered the survey, and of that, 44% right now are attempting to use AI for their job. 25 additional percent said they want to, they really want to, perhaps that's FOMO, perhaps not, but what are they using it for? Of that 44% that are leveraging it, well, let me read you some statistics. 82% are attempting to generate some kind of code. That's a pretty high number. 48% are debugging. Another 34% documentation. Love that one. This is my personal favorite, which is explaining the code base. Using it to look at language that already exists. But less than a quarter are using it for software testing. So this is a true story. This is my story from the January time frame about how I was able to leverage with my team AI to assist us with requirements analysis. What we did was we met with our you know, user base and we got their permission. I'm going to talk with you, I'm going to record it, we're gonna take that transcriptions, are you okay if I leverage a GPT tool to help us and analyze it? The answer was yes. We also crowdsourced via survey. Now it was free form by and large, very little was it rationalized to using Likert, anything uh, along that line. And when we fed all of that in, through a series of very specific prompts, we were able to uncover some sentiments that were not really as overt as we had thought. There were other things that people were looking for in their requirements. So when it comes to requirements analysis, I believe it is strong use of the tool because you're feeding in your language and you are extracting from that. It's not generating that on its own. Things to be concerned about. Make sure you put your prompt into your version control. And don't just put the prompt into version control, but keep track of what model or what service that you are posting it against. Because as we've heard, as we know, those different prompts react differently with different models. Now, why would I talk about diverse data sets? Well, the models themselves have been proven to have issues with bias. It's already a leading practice for you to make sure that you're talking to a diverse user group when you're identifying and pulling those requirements out. But now you have that added need that you have to make sure that you are balancing the potentiality that the model has a bias in it. So make sure that your data sets, make sure that the interviews, make sure the people you talk to represent a diverse set. And of course, rigorous testing, humans in the loop. Now, I personally like it for test cases. And there was some research that was published in the January timeframe that made me take pause. It said that only 42, I'm sorry, 47%, 47% of organizations have automated their testing. I need you to hear that again. 47% have automated their testing. Now, in some of the places where I work, where there's cyber physical systems, when I'm working with the military, I want it to be higher than that. But that also means that 53% have manual testing going on. Well, let's realize and let's be okay with the fact that there's manual testing going on and let's set our QA professionals down in front of a chat engine. Let's make sure that they have their functional requirements, they have their manual test cases, they have their scenarios, that they have their user stories, that they have journey maps. Let them sit down and let them go through chain of thought prompting and allow the GPT to be their muse because you will be surprised how well it can really help. Now. Back to Stack Overflow, 55% said 
said that they were interested in somehow using generative AI specifically for testing, yet only 3% trust it. It could be because it is non-deterministic. Now, I bring that up because you can use um, generative AI to help you with synthetic test data generation, but it's not always going to give you anything that is as accurate as you would like, and there are some gotchas we'll come back to. One of the gotchas is privacy. If you're taking your data, elements of your data, aspects of your data, and feeding it into anybody else's subscription model, if you are not self-hosting and owning it yourself, you could have a data privacy concern. You could also have issues with the integrity of that data. So you have to be highly in tune with what's happening with your information if you're sending it out to a subscription service. Also beware, we've talked about hallucinations. It happens when you generate tests as well. You can have irrelevant tests. I've seen it, I've experienced it, it's kind of funny, but it happens. And back to transparency and explainability. The tests that come forward, the code that comes forward, sometimes it's not as helpful as you'd like it to be. So let's talk about the elephant in the corner. No technical conference would be complete without talking about code generation, right? <gasps> oh. Well, there we go. That was my dramatic ad to the day. Um, so, <laughs> when it comes to coding, there's an interesting trend that's happening right now. Major providers are pulling back from calling it code generation to calling it code completion, and that should resonate with us. And that should point out to us that something's afoot. If they're pulling back from saying code generation to code completion, there's a reason for that. Now, it is fantastic, it is amazing when it comes to explaining your existing code base. Now, you have to be okay with exposing your existing code base to whatever that language model is, whether it's hosted or not. And generally, the code that you get out of this thing will be wonderfully structured. It will be well formatted and occasionally it'll work. Now, there's a study from Purdue University that has shown that when they prompt uh, for software engineering questions, that about 52% of the time, the answers are wrong. So that means we're getting inaccurate code generated. We have to be cognizant of it. Remember, this is groundbreaking potential. This is amazing stuff. Limitations and challenges. Just go in with eyes wide open, gang. These tools can help to generate code. What it can't do is it can't build software. Not yet, not yet. Look at the blue arrow. That's what I want you to focus on. One of three. That's one of three choices for any one piece of code. So in this instance, I've seen it go as high as six, and you're simply asking for a, a module, a function, a small tidbit. The person that you see there is suffering from what we call decision fatigue. Now decision fatigue in the past has been studied with medical professionals, military, the judiciary, places where people have to make really important decisions constantly, they're under high pressure, and their ability to make those decisions deteriorates. In what world should we be studying decision fatigue in software engineering? We shouldn't be. In IDE help can be fantastic when it comes to helping you with that blank page mentality that we get to. It can really help with that. But I can tell you day in and day out, it can cause some fatigue. Groundbreaking potential, know the limitations, know the challenges. Some things to be concerned about, or at least to be aware of, considerations. You will see unequal productivity gains with the different individuals who are using it. Somebody new in career, new to the organization, will have less individual productivity gains than somebody who is more senior who can look at the code and can understand there's a problem. I see it, I see the problem. Code churn, this is something that a company named uh, GitClear has been studying on GitHub for years. From 2019 until 2023, the code churn value 
by industry was roughly the same. What code churn is, is I take that code that I've written or I've had help writing, I check it in, I then check it out. I tinker with it, I check it in, I check it out. There's a problem with it, I check it in, I check it out, code churn. In 2024, we are on pace to double, double code churn. Is it caused by generation? I don't know. Is there correlation? I don't know, but we are going to watch that because that's an interesting number to see rising. And the code is less secure. I know people don't want to believe that. It is. I'll tell you a personal story first. Second week of March, I sat through an entire afternoon workshop. I was using GitHub Copilot. Good tool. It has some real value. We're using Java code base. Uh, and I was able, even with what I thought was pretty articulate and elegant prompting, to have OWASP top tens right there. I had my SQL injection right there in front of me, unless I very clearly articulated, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Be aware, be aware, be aware. That means that the code is less secure by nature, by nature. Now, there was a Stanford study that came out and all of the studies, all of the reports that I'm mentioning are referenced in the bibliography that you'll get when you download this, by the way. But that Stanford report clearly demonstrated it's a security professional's worst nightmare. We tend to think that it's right. We tend to overlook it because it is well formatted. It's, it's almost as though it has authenticity, right? It's, it's speaking to us. It looks correct, so more more issues are sneaking into the code. So what's that mean? We need rigorous testing. We need humans in the loop. As a matter of fact, now we actually need more humans, not fewer humans. Don't worry about losing your job. <laughs> There's a lot for us to do. Generative AI can be unreliable. So pay close attention, pay very close attention. You'll notice that I'm emphasizing the person who has the oversight this time. So there was a North Carolina State University study that came out that said that 58% of us, when we are doing code reviews, are now doing what's called copping out. It means that we only look at the diffs. Well, why does that matter? I was talking to a team member of mine, his name is Carlton, he's a technical lead, has a beautiful team. Um, one of his rock star developers is named Steven. These are real people, so if you want a social engineer and find out who they are, you can. I asked Carlton, how do you do code reviews for Steven? He said, well, I pull it up, I've worked with Steven for five years, I trust his capabilities, I know his competencies, I only look at the diffs. So, okay. When you have someone new in your organization, new to your team, new to, to this domain, what do you do with their code changes? Well, I open them up, I study it, I make sure that they understand what they were doing, I back out into other pieces of the code, I really study it. Okay. So if Steven starts to use a code completion tool or a code generation tool and there's pressure on him to get something done quickly, do you trust him? with the same amount of trust that you had before. And Carlton's eyes got pretty big. I'm going to have to not cop out. Now, if you're doing something like pair programming where you are not necessarily doing the code reviews in the same way, you're gonna wanna rotate partners more quickly. You may want to rotate in a domain expert at some point. Consider more frequent rotations. Also, think about bringing together um, individuals who can help you with more SAST more static analysis with all of these. It's interesting, I think it was the end of last week that there was an announcement from GitLab, I believe. Um, this is not in the bibliography, I'll have to double check this, but they've purchased a tool. They've purchased a corporation that provides SAST because they wanna make sure that there's more SAST scanning going on in the, in the DevOps pipeline, going on in our ability to turn out this code because we have to pay closer attention. By the way, if you're generating code, don't generate the tests. If you're generating the tests, don't generate the code. You need to have that independent verification. This is just smart stuff, right? This is just smart stuff. There can be bias and there can be blind spots. There can also be this really interesting condition that I learned about maybe six or seven months ago called overfitting. 
It's when a model is trained and there's some noise in the training data and it causes it to be hyper-focused in one area. And what can happen with your tests is that they can be hyper-focused in one area of your code base to the exclusion of other areas. Does that mean to not use generative AI tools? No, it means be aware, know the limitations, prepare for it. So is your organization ready to use generative AI for software engineering? Anybody, anybody? I don't see a lot of hands, come on folks, all right. My question to you is, is your SDLC already in pretty good shape? If it is, hot diggity, you might want to amplify leveraging generative AI, but if you have some existing problems, sprinkling some generative AI on top is probably not a good idea. So let's go back to the basics for just a moment. When I get parachuted into a new organization, into a new team, one of the first questions that I ask is, do you own your path to production? And by asking that simple question, it gives me an entire waterfall of cascading other questions to ask. If you can't make a change and understand quickly how it's going to get fielded, you probably have some challenges. And that's when I usually tell teams that we need to step back and start to do the minimums. In 2021, during the height of the lockdowns, I attended the DevOps Enterprise Summit with a number of different friends. It was virtual. And you, if any of you attended, there are lots of different tools where you could belly up to the virtual bar. And I bellied up to the bar with a friend of mine, actually, someone who introduced me to Chris Swan. And my friend Brian Finster and I and six or seven other people were arguing and frustrated with one another. Why is everybody telling us that they can't use DevSecOps, that they can't have a CI CD pipeline? Why are there so many dang excuses? You know what we'll do? We're gonna write down what those minimums are and we did. So that QR code will take you to minimumcd.org, but you can remember that easy enough. And it's an open source listing. We simply are maintainers of documentation, providing people what the minimums are. So what are the minimums? What do you need to do before you start sprinkling AI on top? Make sure you're practicing continuous integration. That means don't leave the code on your desktop overnight. Tell the people on your team, don't leave the code outside the repository, check it in. And if it's not done, that's okay. Put a flag around it, put a feature flag around it so that if it does flow forward, it's not gonna cause a problem. Once you check that code in, how does it get into production? The pipeline. The pipeline determines deployability. It determines releaseability. And how does that magical pipeline do that? Because we as humans sat down and decided what our thresholds were for deployability, and then we codified it into that pipeline. What else is involved? Once that code becomes an electronic asset, it's immutable. Humans don't touch it again. You don't touch the environments. You don't touch anything. Stop touching things. Let the pipeline take care of it. That's a big piece of DevSecOps principles, and it matters, and it helps. You also, whenever you're doing any kind of testing, you want any of the other environments that you're leveraging to be at what's called parity, parity to production. Because I can give you a lot of stories. We'll share drinks tonight and I'll tell you about having environments that were not identical. A thing that you can do to get started is to take a look at the Dora metrics. Pick one, you don't have to pick four. Don't bite off more than you can chew, pick one. Deployment frequency is not a bad place to start. That QR code will take you to the research site. And when you're there, you can also find another tool that it's a quick survey, I think it's four or five questions that'll help you decide which of those metrics to start to track. Don't you love this picture? I just love this picture. Let's talk about the gotchas as we're going forward, gang. If you're adding generative AI into your workflow, your workflow's gonna change. That means your measurements and your metrics are going to change. So if you have people who are really paying attention and looking at your metrics and studying your measurements, let them know that things are going to waver and that you're going to have to train some folks and be aware that if your processes were in okay shape, people have what I call muscle memory. Sometimes they're resistant to change. Does that mean to not do it? No, it just means some things to be aware of. If 
talk about productivity. This drives me friggin' batty. Because it's perceived productivity that the surveys, that the current research, that the current advertisements are all talking about. You are going to have greater productivity. You are going to have greater productivity. Personal productivity. It's perceived at this point, by and large, that productivity is a perceived gain. It means I'm excited. I got a new tool. This is really cool. This is going to be great. It doesn't necessarily mean that I'm dealing with higher order issues, that I am putting features out at a faster pace with higher quality. It doesn't necessarily mean that at all. It means I perceive it. We have to give time for there to be equalizing of the perceived gain to real gain. But that leads to a really much bigger thing. We measure team productivity, not individual productivity. It's how well does a team put software into production, right? It's not how fast does Tracy do it alone. It's how fast do we do it as a team. Now, if you're measuring productivity, and you should think about it, I recommend using Dr. Nicole Forsgren's um, framework. This came out around 2021 with a number of other researchers from Microsoft. What's important is that you see all those human elements that are there. Satisfaction. We actually need to understand if people feel satisfied with what they're doing to understand their productivity. Now, I met with Nicole about three weeks ago, and we're talking about adding in uh, another dimension. Kind of throws off the whole space analogy there. But we're talking about adding in trust. Why does trust matter? If I'm using traditional, traditional AI and ML, and it's deterministic, I can really understand and I can recreate algorithmically, repetitively, again and again and again, that same value. So think about a heads-up display for a pilot. I want them to trust what the AI or the ML algorithm has, has given them. And I do that by proving to them again and again and again that it will be identical. That is the altitude. That is a mountain. You should turn left. Generative AI is, by its nature, non-deterministic. It lies to you. So should you trust it? So we have to understand, as things change, as we start to use generative AI, we have to understand, are we going to be able to trust it? And that's going to give people angst, and we're already seeing some beginnings of that. So we're going to have to understand, how do we measure productivity going forward? Can't tell you 100% how that's going to happen yet. The importance of context. I love this library because this represents your code base. This represents your IP. This represents all the things that you need to be willing to give over access to a model. If you own the model, if it's hosted in your organization, that's a whole lot different than if you decided to use a subscription service. I'm not telling you to not use subscription services. What I'm telling you is to go in eyes wide open and make sure that your organization is OK with things crossing your boundary. I deal a lot with InfoSec organizations, and we talk about the information flow. And if all of a sudden I say, yeah, I'm just going to take the code base to provide as much context as possible and shoot it out the door, you guys don't mind, do you? They mind. Now, this is not to poke an eye in Sneak. I love Sneak. I love their tools. But I want you to, to take away from this is read the pop-ups. Read the end user licensing agreements. Read them. When I saw this, for just a moment, I went, well, how do I flash the cache? Now, it happened to be that I was using some training information, actual workshop code. But if it had been something of greater value, I would have taken pause. So read, read those things. Read the pop-ups. Be aware. Oh, public service announcement. Keep the humans in the loop. So we're going to talk about how we add AI to the enterprise. The next slide might be worthy of coming back to. How do you add AI strat to your strategy, or how do you create an AI strategy? It doesn't matter if you're an organization that has two people. It doesn't matter if you're an organization with 200 or 2,000 or 20,000 people. You may already have a data strategy. What matters is that you do a needs assessment. Don't roll your eyes. I saw that, by the way. What matters is that you get some people together. Perhaps you just sit around the table with some post-it notes, and you talk about what might be a valuable place 
to leverage this. Make a decision. It's not everything at all times, not automatically scaling, which takes me to the second point. Define a pilot. Make sure you have a limited focused pilot so you can try these things out. What I'm telling you is that this has what? Groundbreaking potential. Groundbreaking potential. And there are limitations and there are challenges. When you're going through that pilot, it's going to help you to understand the different types of skills that you're going to need in your organization or if you're going to need to hire more people or if you're going to need to bring more people in. It'll also help you get after those first couple of tranches of governance. And hopefully your governance is, don't do it. No, your governance needs to be relevant and relative to what you are attempting to do. Monitoring and feedback loops, always important. But I want to point out the bottom bullet that's here. It may seem a little strange to you. Why am I telling you that you have to have thought leadership as part of your AI strategy? I'm not talking about sending your people to get up on stage. I'm not talking about writing white papers. What I'm telling you is to make sure that in your organization that you give dedicated time to more than one person to stay abreast and help your organization to stay on top of what's happening. Because it's a tidal wave right now, isn't it? I, I some days don't even like to turn on my phone or read any of my feeds because I know what it's going to say. Another automated picture generated from Dolly. Uh, yeah, too much, too much. Choose when and where to start. How? Map it to a business need. Map it to a need. Make sure it's relevant. And if your need is that you need to get some experience, that's fine. Make a decision. Write it down, architectural decision records, whoop, whoop, whoop. And then make sure that you have some measurements against it. All right, time to design your AI-assisted software engineering tool chain. Why is it that suddenly we've forgotten about all of the software architectural principles, capabilities, and things that we've been doing for decades? Why have we suddenly forgotten about trade-off analysis, about the illities? When you're designing your tool chain, apply that same lens. Is it more relevant for you to take something that's off the shelf because you need time to market? What are my trade-offs? Well, it may be faster, It'll be less tailored to my exact domain need, and it may be less secure. But that may be a choice that we make. It could be that I have the time, energy, finances, abilities to do the tailoring myself. Maybe I instantiate a model internally. Maybe I have an external service, but I have a rag internally. Lots of different variations, but make those choices. Let's not forget about all the things that we've known about for all these years. Leading practices, got to have a leading practices slide. I want to point out that we need to keep humans in the loop. Someone had an, an HITL, I'm going to start to hashtag that. You're going to get sick of it if any of, you, if any of us are connected online. Make sure that everything, everything, everything is in source code. The prompts, the model numbers and names that you're using it against. Secure your vulnerabilities and don't provide your private information into public models, into public engines. I love this picture. It's another one that I love because it makes me take pause. This guy is on a tightrope. He's walking between mountains. Take a look at that. And he's mitigated his risk. He has tethers. So is he doing something dangerous? Yeah. But that's OK because he's mitigating that. I need you to think about 2023 as a year where we really didn't have a lot of good regulation. It's coming about. We're seeing that regulation catch up. But there are challenges with IP. It can be that a model was trained with public information. And so you actually don't own the copyright to the things that you're generating because it tracks back from a lineage perspective as something somebody else owned. Or worse, when you sent it out the door, even if it hasn't been used to directly train a model, let's say that they are keeping on your behalf all of your conversation threads and that they're analyzing those conversation threads and that they're taking IP from that. You can lose ownership of your IP. In the US, we have copyright law. And our copyright law says that a human hand must have touched it. It means I have to be really careful, doesn't it, when it comes to generated code. 
So what questions should you be asking to your providers? Or if you are the people who are providing that service to your enterprise, in the appendix for this, there are two different sheets of different types of questions that I want you to take home and I want you to leverage. I'll give you one or two as a, as a snippet. One, how are you ensuring that the model is not creating malicious vulnerabilities? How are you, what are the guardrails that you have in place if I'm using your model? Or if you're providing that model, how are you ensuring that that's not happening? If there's an issue with the model, and the model needs to be changed, how are you going to notify me so that I can understand what the ramifications are to my value chain, to my value stream? Questions to ask, peeps. So let's look ahead. I'm not going to go into this slide in detail, because it covers generative AI, it covers regular AI, it covers ML. What's important to note is that red arrow, where are we? We're at the peak of inflated expectations. We absolutely are. I completely believe that. And I'm sure all of your social feeds tell you that as well. AI ops is on the rise. Other places, other types of AI and ML will continue to improve. So we're at the beginning of generative AI, but we're well on the way with the others. What do you think it looks like over the next 12 to 24 months? Recently, I've had the opportunity to interview folks from Microsoft, from IT Revolution, from Yahoo, from the Software Engineering Institute, and even some of my colleagues within MITRE Corporation. What we believe, what we're seeing is going to happen, is happening now, is that we're seeing more data silos. Because each one of those areas where a different AI tool is being leveraged is a conversation between me and that tool. You and I, are not sharing session. So we're not having the same experience, especially with those generative AI tools. So for right now, for now, for this moment, more data silos. Data silos means slower flow. Slower flow often means more quality issues. It's gonna get worse before it gets better. And it's groundbreaking potential that we need to know the limitations and the risks for. There's an entire track today about platform engineering. I'm going to foot stomp that there is going to be a continued increase for the need. Because what are platforms for? Whether it's low code, no code, or the new kid on the block that we're doing it for our custom developers, it's making it hard for people to make mistakes. It's codifying leading practices. This is going to continue to increase. If you have a chance to go to today's track, I strongly suggest it. What about this guy? What about this guy? Any of you with adult children who are going to send them off to coding boot camp? Jensen Hong would say, do not do that. The pessimists are saying that AI will replace the coder. The optimists are saying that those who are qualified software engineers, software developers, will be in a great place. So I want you to hear the nuances that are there. If you're good at your craft, if you understand the principles, if you're able to leverage those principles, if you're able to teach others, you'll be fine. What about Devon? Have you heard about Devon? Or have you followed Open, AI, uh, Open Devon that came out about three days after Devon was announced? It's kind of fun to watch it. Right? You see a little video. There's, I think there are six videos on the site. And it is saying that this is an AI software engineer. And what they've done is a form of AI swarming. They have different agents that are plugged in, where one is triggering, one is reacting to it. There are different patterns. One is a coder critic pattern. It's essentially those patterns. We're going to see AI go from being a tool that we independently and individually use to agents that are plugged into our SDLC. And when they get plugged into our SDLC, we're going to have to be cognizant of what that does to the humans in the mix. We're going to give them very defined small roles. So you may have somebody on your team that is a, a Gen AI. Not a Gen X, not a Gen Z, a Gen AI. <laughs> I want to pause for a moment, guys. I want to take you back to 1939. What's that have to do with software? 
It has to do with black and white. 1939 was when The Wizard of Oz was filmed. And it started out as black and white. And I don't know, if there's, if there's anybody here who hasn't seen it, go watch it. Dorothy's house is picked up by a tornado and it is cast over the rainbow and it lands in Oz, smashes the wicked witch and she opens the door. And as she opens the door, she looks out at things that she has never seen before. Munchkins, flying monkeys, an emerald city, all in beautiful technicolor. And do you know where we are? Same technicolor, my friends. The future is amazing. What we're going to do will be amazing. But we're going to need to optimize differently. Right now, our software practices are optimized for humans. I limit work in progress. Why? Because I'm a human. Agile, I take one user story at a time. Why? Because I'm human. We're worried about cognitive overload. Why? Because we're humans. It's not negative. It's just a fact that we finally learn to optimize for the humans. So as we go from having AI agents to having more capable team members or perhaps teams that are made up of many different generative AI agents, we're going to have to figure out how do we optimize and who, who do we optimize for? Exciting. Damn exciting stuff, guys. Damn exciting stuff. But I'm going to take you from Technicolor back to where we are right now. I like to say, we cannot put the genie back in the bottle. Prompt engineering, we need to understand it as a discipline. We need to understand the ethics of prompts. Who owns the generated outcomes? Machine, human teaming. We need to understand all this. What about software team performance? Trust and reliability. But why am I showing you a horse's backside? Well, because a friend of mine named Lonnie Rosales hails from the great state of Texas. And she said, Trace, you can actually trick the genie back into the bottle, but you can't put the poo back in the horse. <laughs> now, she's from the great state of Texas, and I can tell you that the word that she used was not poo. <laughs> but I want you to take that with you. We cannot go back ever, ever, ever to where we were. We cannot go back to where we were. That's OK. We can go into it eyes wide open understanding the challenges and the limits that are there and working together to figure these things out. Your call to action. Go back and pulse your organization. Find out where the shadow gen is being used, the shadow AI is being used. Bring it to the surface, don't shame people, understand how they're using it, and then enable them to do the kinds of research or if they bring forward a need that you help them with that need. Make sure you are looking at cybersecurity as your numero uno issue. Number one, number one, establish your guardrails. Then connect with your providers. Use those questions or be ready to answer those questions if you are the provider of generative AI capabilities to your organization. Now that's your call to action. But I need something from all of you. You're actually the missing piece of my puzzle. As a researcher, I want to understand, how are you using generative AI? How is your organization preparing? How are you personally focusing on getting ready for this? What are you doing? I'm going to be going down to the second floor after this, and I would love if anybody wants to swing by and have a chat on what you're doing. Share your organization's lessons learned. Tell me about your stories. Tell me about the challenges that you have or tell me about the things that you want to learn about because you haven't gotten there yet. By the way, this is in color. What matters in all of this is the humans. We've talked about it all week. This is what matters. Grab that QR code. That'll take you to a download of today's materials. It'll take you to the bibliography as well as that continuum slide. And I've been asked to pop this up and ask you to vote uh, and provide feedback. Thank you guys very much. Thank you.